start then so titanic myths and reality um this is my updated talk originally from um uh, the end of the conference in september last year um but uh it was very much as everyone were going so it kind of and there was some technical difficulties so i thought it's best to kind of uh do it as a web webinar so that people could actually see it and i've also tweaked and tidied it up a bit so hopefully it's even better um so the construction statistics. Uh, name RMS Titanic, Olympic class ocean liner. There were three of them, uh, although I think only two ever existed at any one time, ultimately. Um, owner and operator, White Star Line. Uh, Port of Registry, Liverpool, England. Uh, some people, for some reason, think she sailed from Liverpool, but that was just her Port of Registry. Um, don't think she actually called in um, although there are some links to it. Liverpool. Um, order 17th September 1908. Uh, build a Harland and Wolf Belfast. Uh, if you get the chance to visit Belfast, uh, the Titanic Quarter has a fantastic museum there. Uh, well worth a visit. Um, I was completely blown away. It's basically um includes the site that you see on the right here uh which is the gantries so well worth a visit uh costs 1.5 million which is around about 226 million pounds today uh yard number 401 uh that will crop up later uh tonnage 46,000 uh gross registered tons uh displacement 52,310 tons length 882 feet um Height 175 feet, um, that's kill to funnel, uh, and there's about 100 feet, uh, including the mast to the um, the lookout, uh, which will pro crop up a bit later. Uh, depth 64 feet, uh, obviously that's the, I, I'm not entirely sure which is the level below the water, but it's it's either 64 or the 34, but it's enough to um, see graze something under the water. Uh, there were nine decks A to G, uh, propellers, two three-blade wing and one central. Um, that's important for later as, as well. Uh, cruising speed, 21 knots, approximately 24 miles per hour. Maximum, 23 knots, uh, 26 miles per hour. Uh, and again, um, you'll see some stats later that link in with this. Passengers, 2,453, 2, crew 874, total 3,327 or 3,547 according to other sources. Uh, lifeboats 20, sufficient for 1,178 people. Um, I'll come back to that in a moment. Fate, well, we're all familiar with the fate. She sank uh, and it was very sad, but uh, why did that happen? Um, so she struck an iceberg at 11.40 p.m. ship's time on the 14th of April 1912, uh, approximately, or well, just slightly over 112 years ago, on a maiden voyage with the loss of 1,500 souls. She sank to two hours and 40 minutes later <clears throat> on the 15th of April 1912, um, although the cap ship's captain actually thought she'd only last an hour and a half, so she actually uh, was more buoyant than they thought. Uh, the wreck of the Titanic lies at a depth of around 12,500 feet, 3,800 metres, 2,100 fathoms. Um, she lies 370 nautical miles, that's 690 kilometres south southeast of the coast of Newfoundland. Uh, lies in two main pieces, uh, about 2,000 feet, uh, 600 metres apart, with a vast debris field in between. Um, I'll mention that because that comes up a bit later. Um, some more key facts. Um, so lifeboats, there were 20, which, as I say, was sufficient for 1,000, 
eight people out of the um, up to three and a half thousand passengers and crew, more than the legal requirements at the time. However, it should be noted that lifeboats were used for what was called transshipping, assuming there would always be nearby ships to take survivors on busy shipping routes. So that was the um, the actual uh, assumption at the time. And um, they were kind of close, but not close enough with Titanic, unfortunately. Um, she was equipped with state-of-the-art Marconi radio communication equipment with a range of 1,000 miles. Um, there have been some plans, controversial plans, to actually retrieve that equipment. Um, and that was given the go-ahead like last year, but um, I think they were hampered for some reason, and uh, that hasn't yet happened if it will happen at all. Uh, but obviously the this, this rate of decay with Titanic is such that anything that needs rescuing will need to be done soonish. Um, RMS Carpathia was 58 miles away. SS Californian was 10 miles away when the SOS QCD was sent. Reports of icebergs in the area had been received by the ship many hours before. RMS Carpathia reported them subsequently. The lookout's binoculars were locked in a locker belonging to former second officer David Blair, who hadn't left the key aboard. Um, the second officer, I think, ended up as um, Murdoch, who um, is the guy that uh, they blame was shooting, but I won't necessarily go into that. Uh, the flares fired after the collision were white, not red, as attested to by multiple witnesses on Titanic and SS Californian, although red was not necessarily the uniform um, form of um, of flares at the time, although it was more much more common than white. Uh, Captain Smith was not present on the bridge at the time of the collision, um, but he he did famously stay awake the whole time there was a voyage, uh, so he was around, but just not on the bridge. The sea was calm and the night was clear, but there was no moon visible. The sea temperature was twenty eight uh, Fahrenheit, below freezing at thirty two Fahrenheit. Uh, so that's kind of important for later on. Um, the collision, a collision occurred at 11.40 uh, p.m. ship's time, and the ship was travelling at 20.5 knots, which, as you notice, was not the full speed uh, that she could do. Um, and I think she slowed and reversed um, after immediately hitting, but um, mm -hmm. I'll go into that a bit later. Theories or conspiracies. Uh, coal fire, more than a theory. Um, you can see the circle there. There's a, a bit of a mark. Um, there was a whole documentary on this um, a few years ago, which was actually quite interesting after these photos were found. Um, the coal fire theory proposes that a fire in one of the Titanic's coal bunkers uh, played a significant role in the ship's demise. It suggests that the fire Tablets. weakened... Hello? Sorry? Okay. Um, it suggests that the fire weakened the ship's structure, making it more vulnerable to the impact of the iceberg. Some believe that the crew knew about the fire, but downplayed its severity, leading to a delayed response and ultimately contributing to the sinking. A set of photos discovered a century after the Titanic sank appeared to show a 30-foot scorch mark um, on the starboard side of the ship before it set sail on its maiden voyage, exactly at the point of impact, lending more credibility to the mention at the Board of Inquiry of a fire in the hundreds of tonnes of coal on board. There were hundreds of tonnes of coal stored there. We made no headway against it. We didn't get the fire out. From the day we sailed, the Titanic was on fire. And that was a quote from uh, uh, at the inquiry from one of the crewmen. There was also bad news as the voyage came during a coal strike that had curtailed the voyages of other ships. The coal reserves of other IMM ships were transferred to the Titanic at Southampton. Um, IMM ships, um, the White Star Line was the subsidiary of the um, International um, Marine, oh, I forget what IMM stands for, I'll go a bit later. Uh, but uh, anyway, that was the subsidiary um, and the other ships were part of it. So they gave up their coal. The ship had to sail, much as Challenger had to launch 75 years later. It was political face saving. Um, there had been incidents with um, her sister ship and uh, the whole enterprise was somewhat in jeopardy. So um, it was necessary she sailed. 
Uh, the fire, along with brittle, poor quality steel, is thought to have badly weakened the structure of the ship, warping a bulkhead and hastening her sinking. Um, although I think the open um, portholes are also meant to have contributed possibly more. Um, so again, it's it's how you interpret these things. Uh, conclusion, it's compelling. There certainly was a coal fire, but whether it contributed greatly or not at all, it's hard to say. Californian, uh, unfair blame. So the Californian, as mentioned, was um, was officially the nearest ship, but I'll, I'll get into the next page, which um, possibly contradicts that. Although if you note, she does look a little bit like a sailing ship um, with these um, masts here. So um, plenty of scope for misidentification. So the British Border Trade Investigation states the following conclusion. The Titanic collided with the Berg at 11.40. The vessel seen by the Californian stopped at this time. The rockets sent up from the Titanic were distress signals. The Californian saw distress signals. The number sent up by the Titanic was eight. The Californian saw eight. The time over which the rockets from the Titanic were sent up was from about 12.45 to 1.45 o'clock. Uh, it was about this time that the Californians saw the rockets. At 2.40, Mr Stone called to the master that the ship from which he'd seen the rockets had disappeared. At 2.20am, the Titanic had foundered. It was suggested that the rockets seen by the Californian were for some, from some other ship, not the Titanic, but no other ship to fit this theory has ever been heard of. Except that the Samson could have uh, been that vessel. The number of rockets was disputed, not eight. The Californians' witnesses did not see distress signals, they saw rockets, too low on the horizon to be recognised as distress signals from the nearby ship. The vessel seen nearest the Californian did not disappear at the time the Titanic foundered, but merely sailed away slowly over the horizon to the southwest, in the opposite direction for where the liner is known to have sunk. That vessel had been observed to have secured her light uh, deck lights completely two hours before the Titanic foundered. All survivor accounts assert the Titanic maintained her deck lights until the final moments, offering further evidence that the ship's sighter was not the Titanic. Both vessels carry 360 degree lights that were visible for up to 16 miles. Both vessels were using their lamps to signal the nearby vessel. First, at a range much less than the luminous range of their lamps, and second, on a clear night. But the Californian and the Titanic reported no response from the other vessel. Had these two actually seen each other, neither could have missed the other's signal. Asterisk, remember that. These two ships are each looking at another vessel, not each other. Captain Lord was the only man on board the Californian who had seen the Titanic's virtually identical sister ship, the Olympic, and at a range of five miles. He therefore knew the ship he saw was not Titanic. Conclusion, compelling. Um, I think there should be an asterisk on that. Um, but you'll see the, the next couple of pages, um, I go through why that may not be correct. So, mystery sailing ship. The Samson, and this is particularly controversial, but um, if I didn't have some controversy in here, then I wouldn't be my, one of my talks, would it? Okay. So, question, did you see the light of a boat or anything of that kind? Answer, I saw the light. That was the light we were pulling for when we left the ship. Question, what do you conclude that light was? Answer, a sailing ship. Question, what sort of light was it? Answer, a white light. Question, and was she the sailing ship going away from you? Answer, toward daylight the wind sprung up and she sort of hauled off from us. Did you see her? No, sir. When did you first see her? When I was on the bridge firing the rockets, I saw it myself and I worked the morse lamp at the poor side of the ship to draw her attention. Question, was there any steam coming up through any of the hatches or ventilators? No, sir. The only steam I saw was coming out of the exhaust pipes. 
George Rowe, Quartermaster, that's of Titanic. I was on duty that evening, but I sat with the captain and drank a rum, rum toddy and smoked an evening pipe. Just before midnight, I went on deck, waiting to be relieved. While I was walking there, I noticed two big stars in the sky, far away to the south. These stars were low, very low. I told the watch on the bridge to go up the mast and see what it could be. I thought it might have been American seal hunters. The watchman on the bridge shouted that it was not stars, but lanterns. And he told us that he saw a lot of lights. Then suddenly some rockets appeared. Then suddenly all lights went out and it became dark. Hendrik Berg Thun Nace, a, a mate on the sealing ship Samson. A uh, bit, of, bit of background around this ship. Um, she was a sealing ship and there were seal grounds off of Newfoundland where the incident happened. However, um, it was kind of illegal for them to be uh, sealing at that, that point. Um, I think there was either a ban in place or they needed permits, neither of which uh, the Samson had. So had it been caught up in uh, a disaster, it could have been very problematic for the crew. So slipping away and pretending they didn't see anything would make sense. Um, although there are contra there are um, other versions that the Samson was in Iceland the whole time. So uh, we don't really know. So conclusion, compelling, although the evidence is contradictory. And I've got an asterisk on this one, uh, which is because of this. Was there a mirage? So this is a very new thing that I've only really heard of this year, but um, it makes an awful lot of sense, shall we say. And you may remember these pictures from a couple of years back. So March 2021, two flying ships were pho uh, photographs were published in national newspapers. Both were taken on the 26th of February in clear and calm conditions on the coast of the UK. One was taken in Cornwall and the other in Aberdeen. Both tankers appear to be floating in the sky since they're viewed on the raised horizon, uh, known as the Morgana Fata. But, yeah. um, at the top of a strip mirage referred to as a duct, which obscures the standard horizon. It has been suggested that the weather conditions that caused these mirages may also have contributed to the Titanic disaster. On the night of the 14th of April 1912, the optical distortion, superior mirage, false horizon effects of a fog bank around the horizon reduced the contrast between icebergs, sky and the sea. The effect was that Titanic's lookout saw the critical iceberg a few moments too late as the berg appeared suddenly as a dark object out of the peculiar haze in front of them. Articles found in the Times archive claim to support the theory as put forward by a UK-based historian and broadcaster, uh, Tim Moulton. Um, one such article is a report detailing Titanic lookout Reginald Lee's mem memories of the fateful occasion. He was on lookout duty alongside Frederick Fleet when the collision happened. Remember Frederick Fleet for later. He thought the haze was extending all around the horizon without a certain locality. When they were in the lifeboats, they could see a further distance. So compelling. Um, there's a diagram here um, where you can see there's a false horizon if you're high up. But if you're below it, you can kind of see the actual horizon. And the iceberg may have been uh, kind of obscured in that. So the report suggests that Titanic had sailed into a thermal inversion. Thermal inversions occur when a band of cold air sinks beneath warmer air. In this case, the cold air came from the Labrador Current along the Canadian coast, and the warmer air came up from the Gulf Stream. For those at sea level, light bends over the true horizon, allowing to, them to see further than they normally would. Higher up, the gap between the true horizon and false horizon can appear as a haze, which could explain why those in the ship's crow's nest, 100 feet high, could not see the iceberg until it was too late. To those on lookout duty, the iceberg was obscured by the mist. Without the mirage, they might, might have been able to see the iceberg in time to prevent the disaster. Further, the thermal inversion effects could have contributed to the strange testimonies from both Titanic and SS Californian as distances and communications could have been distorted and obscured. 
Perhaps Californian was the mystery ship after all. Conclusion, compelling. I'm very, I, yeah, I'm, I'm very taken with this, particularly uh, when you consider that uh, those who left the life, lifeboat said it was really calm until morning. Um, and there was actually a whole, almost like a circle of um, icebergs uh, around the uh, wreck site. So it certainly could have happened. Eyewitness evidence, icebergs. For the first time we saw where we were, near us was open water, but on every side was ice. Ice 10 feet high was everywhere, and to the right and left and back and front were icebergs. The sea of ice was 40 miles wide, they told me. There you go, quite compelling. Uh, did you see any ice when on watch? No, sir. Only when we struck, when we passed it on the starboard side. Question, how, how high was that iceberg? Roughly 100 feet, sir. So around about the same height as the um, crow's nest. George Rowe, quartermaster. Sinking. We heard a sort of rumbling sound and the lights were still on on Titanic. And the lights were still on at the rumbling sound, as far as my memory serves me. Then a sort of an explosion, then another. <clears throat> Seemed to be one, two or three rumbling sounds. Then the lights went out. Then a dreadful calls and cries. Arthur, po Arthur Pushin, first class passenger. When the call came that she was going, I covered my face and then heard someone call. She's broken. After what seemed a long time, I turned my head only to see the stern almost perpendicular in the air so that the full outline of the blades of the propeller showed above the water. She then gave her final plunge and the air was filled with cries. So that, that's an, a testimony that said she broke in half, uh, which um, we know she did uh, from the wreck site, but was actually um, discounted, in fact, at the, um, at the official board of inquiry. So there we go. To the last, those poor musicians stood there playing Nearer My God to Thee, Gertrude Hibbert, first class passenger. Third class. There was a gate between the steerage and the first class deck. Yes, the first class deck was higher up than the steerage deck and there were some steps leading up to it, nine or ten steps and a gate just at the top of the steps. Was the gate locked? It was not locked at the time we made the attempt to get up there, but the sailor, or whoever he was, locked it so that this fellow that went up after him broke the lock on it and the steerage passengers went up on the first class deck at this time when the gate was broken. They all got up there. You could not keep them down. Daniel Buckley, third class passenger. So just to mention on this, um, it was a legal requirement to keep the third class steerage passengers separate because... Um, they had to be checked for lice, et cetera, and they were the ones that were most likely to be emigrating. Um, so literally they they had to be kept separate um, on, on these journeys. Uh, although some of the, the, the testimonies about when things were locked um, do kind of contradict, um, but I think it's generally agreed that um, a fair amount of time before she actually sank, um, they were all unlocked because uh, as soon as, the order was given to abandon ship, they would have been allowed to open the um the, the locked gates. Although possibly there was a panic about the the number of people and so they may have relocked it, but that wouldn't that wouldn't have been down to the captain. So let's get into some conspiracy theories then. This is the this is the most common one, and um you'll see I'm not really a fan, but uh, there we go. So if you look, this is um, Olympic uh, on the left, uh, and she's got an open top deck uh, just below the funnels there. Uh, and Titanic, the wreck, has a sealed in deck. <laughs> so the most popular conspiracy theory is the most nonsensical one. So the theory goes that due to her expensive collisions, especially with HMS Hawk, uh, for which the Olympic was found responsible. Since the launch, the RMS Olympic had become uneconomical to repair, and so it was decided to switch the Olympic with Titanic for her maiden voyage, sink her, and claim the insurance. The Titanic had been built with an enclosed promenade deck. Olympic had not. This hampered the efforts to launch the lifeboats, as stated by witnesses, so it was certainly present, as we can see by comparing the wreck with Olympic. 
Um, furthermore, the name letters were individually welded onto both vessels and would have corroded badly enough to have fallen. The yard number of Titanic was 401, which I remember um, mentioned earlier. Her older sibling, 400. Evidence of the presence of yard number 401 has been found on the wreckage, including on the central propeller pictured. So if you look carefully at that picture, um, it actually says 401. It would be quite a feat to have taken that down and swap it or stamp it on. So I think it was there. This doesn't mean that insurance fraud wasn't committed, because uh, I think there's there's quite a few cases where we think that it was. But that the ship that sank was most definitely the Titanic. RMS Olympic, old reliable, she became known, survived the First World War, unlike her third sibling, Britannic, that hit a mine and sank in the Mediterranean as a <coughs> ship. Olympic was scrapped in 1937 in Jarrow. She was replaced by RMS Queen Mary after the merger of Cunard. Some remnants were auctioned in Jarrow and exist to this day. So theory busted. So it was Titanic. The Fed theory. Now, I, I like this one, but it's very, very controversial. Uh, John Pierpont Morgan conspired with powerful bankers to silence the opposition to the creation of the Federal Reserve Bank, or so the theory goes. It's a compelling theory. The insurance claims would have been a useful bonus, especially if cargo could have been listed on any inventories, but not actually loaded, since White Star Line was a subsidiary of IMM owned by JP Morgan. The Fed was the brainchild of members of the Money Trust of New York-based bankers and certain politicians. It privatised the money supply and loaned it back to the USA with interest. It's a good gig. It was voted on at the start of the Christmas recess of the Senate in 1913, 18 months after the sinking of Titanic, after some key members had already left on their vacations. So it's 54 to 34 out of 96. Uh, there were two senators per state because back then there were 48 states in 1913. It was quickly signed into law by President Woodrow Wilson on 23rd December 1913, all very cloak and daggers. Now that's all documented. The connection with Titanic is just a, a conspiracy. Uh, wealthy passengers John Jacob Astor IV, Archibald Gracie, Benjamin Guggenheim, Isidore Strauss-Kahn, George Denikwick, George Wiedner, John B. Thayer, Colbert and Margaret Brown were certainly all aboard, aboard the Titanic whilst J.P. Morgan had booked himself on Titanic, but ended up cancelling at short notice. Um, Margaret Brown was also known as the unsinkable Margaret Brown because she did survive. Isidore Strauss Kahn was thought to be a supporter of the Fed plan, whilst the others varied in their views, though some would have lost out in the changes that the establishment of a central bank base that was no longer based upon the gold standard. And in fact, at the time of the sinking, um, John Jacob Astor IV was the, the wealthiest man in the world. The adoption of free silver, the watering down of the gold standard by adding in silver to bolster reserves some years before, had been vehemently opposed by at least one of those aboard, however. It may have been hoped by those aboard that a meeting might take place with J.P. Morgan on his own ship to discuss the Fed plans, but he wasn't aboard, so that never took place. Although... A meeting that did take place uh, was at um, Jekyll Island. You might say, oh, no, it didn't happen. But it's actually documented in um, like um, some official accounts of a bank. At the end of November 1910, Senator Nelson W. Aldrich, an assistant secretary of the U.S. Treasury Department, A.P. Andrew, and five of the country's leading financiers, Frank Vanderlip, Henry P. Davison, Benjamin Strong and Paul Wahlberg arrived at the Jekyll Island Club to conduct a secret meeting to plan the country's monetary policy and banking system, formulating during the meeting the Federal Reserve as America's next central bank. According to the Federal Reserve Bank of Atlanta, the 1910 Jekyll Island meeting resulted in drafted legislation for the creation of a US central bank. Parts of this draft, the Aldrich Plan, were incorporated into the 1913 Federal Reserve Act. We don't know if J.P. Morgan was present at any time, nor if any discussions were made in respect to those opposed to the legislation. 
but this meeting predated the collision of RMS Olympic with HMS Hawk, so it's unlikely but not impossible that a complex plan may have been hatched to make use of one of the Olympic-class liners to eliminate high-profile opponents of the Aldrich plan. What is true is that many notable people died on the Titanic who might have changed the world had they not died in the tragedy. In fact, there were um, some athletes and uh, uh, you know high-profile artists, etc. So, yeah, things might have changed in different ways had she not sunk. Conclusion, plausible, but unlikely. Foretellings and premonitions. Foretelling, the wreck of the Titan. Then I, I like this one. This is kind of interesting. By the way, some of the illustrations are from postcards that I, um, I purchased at auction because I live quite near to the uh, the auction house where they, they specialise in Titanic memorabilia. So um, I um, I splashed out a bit. Not, not too much, but just a little. In 1898, Morgan Robertson published the novella Futility, which was later renamed The Wreck of the Titan. The short book describes a fictional ocean liner named the Titan, which is praised as an unsinkable ship. And yet, one April night, the Titan strikes an iceberg off of Newfoundland. It sinks and the majority of its passengers die. The parallels between the story and the actual Titanic disaster are obvious. The names are nearly identical and the Titan and the Titanic have similar designs. Um, Titan reappears later, as you might remember. Titan is 800 feet long, the Titanic 883 feet, and both can reach speeds close to 25 knots. Likewise, the Titanic had just 20 lifeboats, while the Titan had 24. When the Titanic went down 14 years after Robertson's story came out, Robertson became famous. People called him a clairvoyant, but he was quick to distance himself from this label. Instead, he explained that he was just an expert in sea travel, as his father had been a sea captain and had gone with him on voyages since childhood. Um, I haven't been able to 100% conclude this last bit, but um, there's certain evidence for it. Robertson later published a, la a later story called Beyond the Spectrum. In it, a war breaks out between the United States and Japan due to a Japanese sneak attack on US ships. So interesting, that one. Premonitions. Uh, I've taken this from a chapter of my book where there's uh, kind of a fuller story of one of the premonitions. Um, Isaac Froentel was a lawyer from New York. After the Titanic had set sail, he told his brother and new sister-in-law of his dream before boarding the Titanic. It seemed to me that I was only on a big steamship which suddenly crashed into something and began to go down. I saw in the dream as vividly as I could see, with open eyes, the gradual settling of the ship, and I heard the cries of frightened passengers. As the lifeboat began to lower, Henry's wife threatened to jump out of the boat if her husband did not join her. On impulse, the two brothers jumped down into the lifeboat, and all three Frauentels were saved. Nora Keane, from Castle Connell, had a sudden premonition that the Titanic would sink when boarding at Queenstown. Speaking openly of her fears, um, Queenstown is now a cove, or it's spelt C-O-B-H in, in Southern Ireland. Speaking openly of her fears when the vessel was barely underway, it is one of a number of verified incidents of foreboding and one of the most chilling. She was so overcome with sudden dread as she tottered towards the towering Titanic that she dropped her rosary and prayer book into the water as she was going up the, the gangway from the Queenstown tender. Um, they did actually, uh, because the Titanic is so big, she couldn't get into the harbour. So they used tenders to transfer passengers from both um, Cherbourg and uh, Queenstown to her. Uh, Southampton, she was birthed in a in a large berth. If you've seen the film, you'll, you'll note that the uh, mud was kind of stirred up by Titanic because she was especially dredged out for her and her sister ships. Nellie Hocking, a 21-year-old girl from Cornwall and the heroine of my novel, The Heiress, plug, uh, had put the fear of God into Nora Keane by telling her how she had heard a cock crow on the Titanic at dusk on the fateful Sunday. Hearing such a cry while travelling on a journey is viewed as an ill omen in Cornish custom. However, Nellie had not been imagining things. There was a live rooster and other poultry on the Titanic, because she was so big. First-class passengers Mary Grease and Ella Holmes-White were importing a clutch of French chickens to the United States. 
So um, interesting premonitions, but um, maybe the cock crow wasn't as um, as special. Um, just a terrible disaster. So at the end of the day, the Titanic disaster could just have been a terrible accident. Mistakes were certainly made, and some decisions seem inexplicable now. The inquiries may have been whistle uh, whitewashed to protect the guilty over their gross failings, but that doesn't mean that there was a pre-planned conspiracy to claim the insurance and dispose of people who opposed a very lucrative piece of legislation. We'll probably never know. Ultimately, all of the people directly involved with the Titanic at the time are now long gone. But the myths, ghosts and legends live on to this day. And speaking of ghosts, I mean, let's face it, uh, you guys want ghosts, don't you? So I better talk about ghosts. <laughs> Just excuse me one moment, I need to let the doggy out for a moment. <laughs> Sorry about that. Okay. Haunted exhibitions. Now, um, that's a picture uh, of a, a big piece. <laughs> so in 1998, fresh after the success of the Titanic movie, salvage crews brought up the big piece, which is what you see here, Titanic that had been torn loose in the debris field at the bottom of the ocean. Remember the vast debris field I mentioned. Other artifacts have also been recovered from wreck and put on display subsequently. Um, I think the debris field has generally been thought of as kind of fair game because of um, the, um, oh God, hang on a second, dog's got out. Abby, Benji's got out, do you want to get in? Hello? Sorry about that. Okay. Um, yeah, so um, other artifacts have been recovered from the wreck and put on display subsequently. Most of them have been uh, from the debris field uh, because it's not part of the ship. <laughs> so kind of fair game. Visitors around the Big Piece travelling exhibition have described feeling nausea and being ill at ease in proximity to the whole piece from Titanic. The Titanic artifact exhibition at Luxor is said to be extremely haunted. Eerie sounds, uneasy feelings and actual sightings of ghost, ghostly spectres have been reported. Resident expert Joe Zimmer claims that he's had his name called and his hair and clothing tugged on, all followed by the sounds of laughter. And at night, Zimmer reports hearing a phantom orchestra play. So I must admit, I haven't actually found out what type of expert he is, but he's claimed to be an expert, so I guess he's an expert. Employees and guests alike have, have seen a mysterious woman who wears a black period dress with a white collar and her hair in a bun. In one case, the photographer was pre preparing for the opening of the exhibition and he spotted the woman casually walking down the grand staircase. He was startled as he hadn't seen anyone enter and the staircase was roped off. He assumed she was part of the exhibit and asked if she'd like him to photograph her. She ignored him. He went back to setting up, but suddenly she was directly behind him. Again, he offered a photograph, but this time she just vanished. The strangest revolved around a picture of the unpopular Bruce Ismay. Whilst opening the exhibition, staff noticed his picture on the floor, leaning against the wall. The surveillance footage showed the picture shaking as it was gently placed on the floor by unseen hands. Now, um, Bruce Ismay uh, was actually the, the owner of um, the White Star Line. And uh, some of the decisions that um, people thought were not great on lifeboats and speed and stuff are uh, generally put down to him. And because he survived when most people thought he should have died, um, he got a lot of hate afterwards. So he became very unpopular. Other hauntings. So Frederick Fleet, I remember I mentioned him earlier, um, served as a lookout aboard the RMS Titanic. His grave went unmarked until the Titanic Historical Society erected a headstone for him in 1993. Witnesses have claimed to see him keeping watch over the Las Vegas exhibition's promenade deck. According to Louise and Neil Bonner, owners of the former home of Titanic captain Edward John Smith, the shipmaster lingers in his house. The couple has been renting out his 19th century 
Victorian house and their tenants have reported feeling icy chills passing through them, hearing strange noises and even seeing full bodied apparitions of the captain. So that might be a tip for anyone who's wanting to see um, a sea captain uh, on a haunting, if you want to find that place. Going to Mr Bonner, some years ago we had a single chap living in there and he rang up one day, convinced he'd seen the ghost of the captain. He was in bed when he saw him drift across the room. Woo. More hauntings. Captain Smith's very popular with hauntings, but then he, he's effectively Captain Birdseye if you look at him. <clears throat> in 1977, Second Officer Leonard Bishop of the SS Winterhaven gave one of his passengers a tour of the ship. The passenger was softly spoken, had a British accent, and was unusually attentive to detail. Bishop thought the man was odd, but could not quite put his finger on what seemed out of place. A few years later, someone showed him a picture of Captain Edward John Smith. Bishop said, I know him. I gave him a tour of my boat. His companion laughed and said, Impossible. That man was the captain of the Titanic. After his death, Captain Smith's housekeeper, Ethelwyn, was invited to choose any one item of his property as a keepsake and in lieu of wages. A letter written by Ethelwyn's sister-in-law, Hilda, and sold along with the item at auction, stated that the housekeeper chose the silver mirror. The note, addressed to Ida, then chillingly added, she, Ethelwyn, always spooked me when she said that at times she could see Captain Smith's face in it on the anniversary of when the Titanic was sunk. <clears throat> so there we go. So the Titan submarine, uh, the Titan, if you remember, was the uh, the name of the ship in the uh, premonition uh, book. 112 years after the sinking of the Titanic, the interest in the ship shows no sign of abating. Only last year, on the 18th of June 2023, while transporting tourists to visit the wreckage of Titanic, the submersible Titan imploded, instantaneously killing all those on board. OceanGate CEO Stockton Rush said, there's only one wreck that everyone knows. If you ask people to name something underwater, it's going to be sharks, whales, Titanic. OceanGate's Titan was used for several survey expeditions at a Titanic wreckage site starting in 2021. Titan was controversially made of composite materials rather than the more usual solid metal tube. Submersible was carrying wealthy tourists Hamish Harding, uh, Shahzada Dawood and his son Suleiman Dawood, crew member and Titanic expert Paul Henri Margello, and OceanGate founder Stockton Rush who was the submersible's pilot. The parallels between the fight of Titanic and Titan are quite profound. Uh, again, the rich perished on a, a journey that um, shouldn't have really happened, I guess. <clears throat> the mother of all disasters. So the loss of the Titanic on 15th of April 2023 was the biggest lo loss of passengers' lives in peacetime and remained so for 75 years. Um, that should say 2013, 2020, 2012, in fact. Um, but there we go. Um, 1,517 lives were lost, according to the US Committee, and the British Board of Inquiry settled on 1,503. Uh, the records, and um, well, they, they weren't great. And some people did slip away, much like um, Rose in the, uh, in the movie, of course, who was a mythical person. The crew suffered proportionately worse than 700, um, worse with 700 fatalities out of about 870. Third class lost three quarters of their number of only 174 survivors out of 710 passengers, men suffering proportionately worse. The onset of radio communication and extreme loss of life coupled with the occasion of the maiden voyage of the world's largest ship carrying and losing some of the wealthiest people in the world have made this disaster the first amongst equals. In terms of world events, only Pearl Harbor, the atomic bomb, JFK's assassination, the moon landing, the Challenger disaster, and 9-11 have matched its lingering appeal. The end. Uh, references follow. So, um, 
and just litter back me. Okay, I'll stop sharing at that point. Fabulous. Thank you so much, Amethyst. That was really, really interesting. Really Thank enjoyed you. that and, and learned quite a lot from that myself as well. That's, That's good. Excellent. Thank you. Um, Christian, I...